along. All right, we are now recording. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this is an, a slightly adapted performance of, I, I said performance because I saw in the chat, but yeah, performance, we'll say it. Um, <laughs> yes, I am Judy Garland in so many ways. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so we did this presentation at the North Carolina Serials Conference. It was my first time attending that conference. I have a feeling some of y'all have probably been there before. It was great, really good conference. Um, lots of really interesting stuff that like I usually wouldn't be learning about. So I really enjoyed that, but we did this presentation there. Um, we have done some slight modifications here to make it a little bit more interactive because, um, well, we were told there that we had 30 minutes, but they actually kind of cut us off at 20. So um, it ended up being a, a very compressed presentation, but today we really get to take our time and, you know, just live in the presentation. So um, you all know us, but I'm Jenny Dale. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the information literacy coordinator here. And I'm Anna Kraft, and I also use she, her pronouns, and I'm the coordinator of metadata services. And our titles are important here because one of the things that we are talking about in this uh, presentation is that we are gonna be looking at some intersections between the work that the two of us do, even though that may not automatically come to mind as sort of collaborative opportunities, we were able to find a lot of connections. Um, so I did wanna give a land acknowledgement. We did this as well, particularly because it was a virtual conference, but we do wanna just acknowledge as always that the land we are on here in Greensboro, North Carolina, has long served as the site of meeting and exchange amongst a number of indigenous peoples, specifically the Kiawi and the Sara. And we also want to, or uh, would be remiss not to acknowledge these long history and lasting legacies of slavery and settler colonialism on these lands. So here's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna talk about information literacy and we're gonna talk about a specific sort of skill or tool that you can use to practice your information literacy skills called lateral reading. We're gonna make some connections between information literacy skills and what researchers need, focusing really on researchers, maybe at the, maybe at the graduate student level, but mostly like postdoc faculty folks who are sort of in that professional researcher area. We're gonna look at some examples of predatory publishing solicitations and websites, which is probably my favorite part of this presentation. Um, we're going to talk about some resources that can help you evaluate journal quality as well as um, some of these sort of skills related to lateral reading and information literacy that can help you with that. And then we're also going to answer questions that you might have about evaluating publication quality. So that's where we're headed today and we'll start with information literacy. So I, in presentations like this, again, this was a slightly different um, audience than I typically have. So I wanted to make sure to provide a, uh, a just a general definition of information literacy. So I'll do that for us today. Uh, information literacy, according to the Association of College and Research Libraries, is the set of integrated abilities encompassing the reflective discovery of information, the understanding of how information is produced and valued, and the use of information in creating new knowledge and participating ethically in communities of learning. Now, one of the things that I'm gonna ask y'all to do here, so I'm gonna have you take a quick little poll for me. We're gonna use Mentimeter. None of you are surprised if you have ever seen me present before, but I am gonna go ahead and put the link and the code in the chat box. Um, but if you are, uh, if you have a smartphone that has QR code enabled, you can also just scan the screen. Um, code is also on screen, 6947. 24, 38. Oops, no, I accidentally added an extra number. Sorry, again, handling it like a true professional today. So hopefully you can see it on the screen, but if you do want to paste it, we will make sure that you actually can do that. Oops. All right, so it is a quick Mentimeter poll about the ACRL framework. That is where the definition that I shared on the previous slide is taken from. Um, so I just like to find out if folks are 
uh, familiar with it. So I'm going to go ahead and open the results. This is a pretty quick little um, poll. Let me exit full screen here so I can actually click that link. At some point during the spring semester, um, the little navigation features in Google Slides changed, and it was a it's been a real struggle for me to actually just figure out uh, how to teach that way. Okay, so um, this group is a bit more uh, aware of the ACRL framework than the group was at the North Carolina Serials Conference. I think that's awesome. We've had, we have some not at all heard of it, some exposure to it, and like, oh, I'm so familiar, I have a favorite frame, I bet I can guess who some of those people are. Um, all right, so just wanna talk a little bit, <laughs> Rachel, I knew one of them was you, it had to be. You have a cross stitch of one of the frames in your in your uh, office at work. So the ACRL framework, just to give you some some basics, it is um, a document, sort of a guiding document, created by a task force within ACRL, and it was adopted in 2015. And the idea was that it would replace the information literacy competency standards, which are very sort of checklist task based, um, but have been in place since since 2000. Um, the focus is really on the higher education context. And one of the things I thought about a lot as we were preparing for this presentation initially is that there's really not much in there about anyone other than students. And I'm kind of assuming based on the way they talk about students um, in terms of their information literacy skills that really their focus was on undergraduate students. And that's that makes sense, totally reasonable. ACRL is the Association of College and Research Libraries. That's obviously undergrads are a very large audience for us, but um, I think one of the ways that this can be implemented more effectively on the local or institutional level is to think about, okay, who else, who else's information literacy skills matter? Because it's really everyone. Um, this framework document draws on threshold concepts theory, meta-literacy, metacognition, and the understanding by design model. And if you are interested in any of those things, I am always happy to talk about any or all of them. This is how the framework is structured. There is an introduction, that's where the definition that I shared earlier is. Uh, it's sort of a conceptual explanation of what the framework is as a document, how it's meant to be used. Uh, there are six frames, and we can think of these frames as interconnected core concepts or sort of big conceptual understandings. So Rachel mentioned authority. One of the frames is authority is constructed and contextual as an example, and we will talk more about that one. But in each frame, there's sort of a description and discussion of the frame and what that what this the sort of simplified statement or concept actually means. Then there is a list of knowledge practices for each frame which for those of you who have done a lot of teaching or training and have the, um, you know, the mindset of thinking about student learning outcomes, they're kind of like student learning outcomes, but not exactly. Um, so they are really focused on sort of cognitive abilities related to the frames. And then there are dispositions and the dispositions, this is a big new thing with the framework that definitely wasn't in the um, standards before it, uh, because this is really about motivation, about the sort of affective dimensions of learning, about what we um, want our information literate students or information literate learners to value about information. Um, so if you haven't read it, there are a couple of people who said they were like completely unfamiliar with it. It is actually, and I'm biased because I'm an information literacy librarian, but I think it is a really interesting document. And I'd love for us as an organization to kind of look at it and think about how we might be able to use it in kind of innovative ways. But that's that's beyond the scope of this presentation. Well, it relates to this presentation. There are also three appendices. One is about implementing the framework. And the whole kind of idea there is that it's not meant to be implemented one particular way. You're supposed to be able to flexibly implement it the way that works best to your institution. There is a lengthy appendix about how the framework was developed. Um, and if you happened to be on any information literacy listserv back around 2014, when this was in discussion, it was, it was in heavy discussion. It was, it was a pretty contentious process. Um, and then finally, some sources for further reading. Um, so we are going to talk about these frames. They are organized within the framework just alphabetically. Um, they are very careful to say that this is not some sort of linear list. You don't you know, kind of finish one and start another. Really, you kind of never finish any of them. 
Um, and they also, again, are all kind of interconnected. You can't, you can't have one without some of the other ones. So these are authorities constructed and contextual, information creation as a process, information has value, research as inquiry, scholarship as conversation, and searching as strategic exploration. Um, and the ones that I hear people tell me are their favorites most often are authorities constructed and contextual, um, information creation as a process, and then um, searching as strategic exploration. And a lot of these draw on things that we as library personnel have thought about and talked about and taught about for a long time. Okay, so I would love to hear from you Today we're going to be talking specifically about how we can help researchers evaluate journal quality and you know kind of ideally you know avoid potential predatory journals. So if you're looking at these concepts as you see them listed here, I would love to know which one of these one or ones multiple is fine. Do you think connect with these kind of efforts that we're talking about today. Um, which, which sort of concepts that you see on this screen seem like they would be helpful when we're talking about helping researchers really evaluate the quality of journals. And you can just pop those in the chat if you feel like it. Yeah, Alyssa, I agree with you, definitely. Um, C says number three, I mean, that's, I think information has value, yep. Definitely authority, good one, Anna. It's almost like you know what's coming up. Um, one of the things I, I like that you pointed out, Alyssa, that information has value because, well, there's a lot of implications for that with this particular kind of application, right? Number one, sometimes these predatory journals want you to pay them, and that's a value, right? It's a very capitalist value. Um, we also sometimes will have situations where if you end up publishing in predatory journals, it can actually sort of be seen as reducing your credibility and your scholarly value in that way. Yep, so Steve and Rachel also both bring up scholarships of conversation. I agree completely with that. I really think we can probably see some reflections of all of these when we're having these kind of conversations. Um, the one we are going to focus on the most today is authorities constructed and contextual. Uh, and here are two examples of research or of knowledge practices under that frame from the framework. Um, so there's the first one, which is about using research tools to sort of de decide on credibility. And then the second one is all about, you know, kind of knowing your discipline and understanding um, that there are maybe some widely accepted uh, markers of authority or even well-known sort of authoritative authors and publications. And that connects to what we're gonna talk about. Um, Next, which is, I did a little bit of a literature review for this. Um, and one of the sources that I found um, very interesting was from Tenapir et al. And these authors in 2016 surveyed more than 3,600 researchers internationally. Um, and what they were trying to figure out is how do, they, how do they define trust? How do they decide if a publication or um, some other sort of form of scholarly output would be considered trustworthy? And how has that changed as scholarly communication has changed pretty rapidly, you know, over the last decade or so. And most of the respondents in, still indicated that peer review was kind of their biggest, strongest indicator of trustworthiness, both in determining what they wanted to read as scholars and where they wanted to publish their own work. Um, and I think, you know, for, for most of us, this won't be a surprise, right? This is often held up as sort of the gold standard of authority in terms of scholarly publications. Um, so I pulled out this quote, however, with all of the changes in dissemination channels, the methods and criteria used to justify trustworthiness and quality remain surprisingly traditional. Um, and there's more that, that you can read there. And again, let me paste um, the link to the slides in case you want to get back to these later. Um, but one of the points that these authors made is that, you know, the people that they surveyed were really aware of lots of changes in the way that we um, disseminate scholarly publications or, or scholarly communication, but they were still pretty tied to traditional criteria. Journal ranking, peer review, um, you know, again, sort of just like quality control types of things. Um, and that's interesting when we're thinking about the changing landscape of scholarly communication and what we might 
what what might make it hard to convince scholars to do things like uh, accept open access as a as a sort of viable option for publishing. It still has all of these things, but it's sort of new enough that sometimes it doesn't meet those traditional measures. Um, the way that you know a long established publication that was only ever in print might. So speaking of a changing scholarly communication and publishing landscape, this is a bit of a newer article. Um, and this is a lot more uh, narrowly focused in terms of who was surveyed. But Swanberg and colleagues um, surveyed faculty at Oakland University. Um, and that included professors uh, and faculty members from all fields as well as from their medical school. Um, so they had a really pretty wide range of folks who did respond. Uh, and they were trying to answer these two research questions. What gaps, if any, exist in faculty members' knowledge of predatory OA journals and are basically, do, are they able to identify them? And then what are their attitudes towards these journals? Um, so they really expressed, the faculty who responded expressed a really wide range of confidence levels. I think most people felt that they were at least sort of like low level confident about this, but very few actually reported that they were super highly confident about their ability to identify uh, predatory journals and to assess journal quality more generally. Uh, and they were also asked what specific resources they use. And I think their responses are really interesting here. First was colleagues. So they would go to colleagues directly and say, have you heard of this? What do you know about it? Is this a good place to publish? Um, Google was the next highest or, or other similar search engines, but Google we know is has, has that market cornered pretty hard. Um, and then finally, sort of professional listservs or websites or, or professional lists even of these kinds of publications. Uh, one of the reasons I liked that is because we are gonna talk about Google and how important search engines can be as a tool for lateral reading in a few minutes. Uh, another poll quote here, um, but one of the things that I found really interesting about this is that this is pretty similar to what I often hear from undergraduate students. What, what these faculty said they wanted was a checklist. 71% of respondents were like, can you just give me a checklist of things that I need to do to make sure that whatever I'm looking at is a credible or um, you know, authoritative and non-predatory open access journal. But the librarians at this institution at Oakland University have really focused less on sort of a checklist approach and more on sort of helping their users at all levels develop strong critical thinking skills as it relates to appraising quality and legitimacy of journals. And they even mentioned some overlap with the framework. So there's a little bit of a tension there in that the faculty are reporting like, yeah, I just want you to give me a list of the things that can help me figure this out on my own, sort of no muss, no fuss. And the librarians are thinking, well, we, we can do that to an extent, but you also are going to have to build up some of these um, critical thinking and critical appraisal skills. So jumping back to the slide we had earlier about authorities constructed and contextual, um, what I'm really going to focus on here is this idea of that first knowledge practice using research tools and indicators of authority to determine the credibility of sources and understand the elements that might temper this credibility. In my experience, one of the best ways that you can do this is through a process or a skill or a strategy called lateral reading. And this term comes from Sam Weinberg, who is a professor at Stanford um, and is the founder of the Stanford History Education Group. Sheg. You sometimes hear about them in the news. They did a bunch of, they've done a bunch of research on what they call civic online reasoning. Um, and it actually got quite a bit of coverage in the news 2015, 2016. Um, but they have some really cool content up that's available if you're interested. Um, and Weinberg and one of his colleagues, Sarah McGrew, who was working with Sheg, uh, did research. They actually did it in 2016. It wasn't published until 2019. But they had three groups of internet users, um, and these were uh, Stanford undergraduate students, professional PhD holding historians, and professional fact checkers. And they asked those three groups of people to uh, deal with six internet-based tasks. Um, and one of the things they found was that fact checkers were far and away better at pretty much everything that they were asked to do than our professors and our students. Um, and one of the things that was particularly helpful was a heuristic they applied called lateral reading. 
Um, and they, as it says here, almost immediately, so what, what makes this lateral, and we're gonna watch a short video clip in a minute, is that it's about going off the site itself and looking maybe have a bunch of tabs open laterally, horizontally across your screen um, so that you can sort of investigate the source before you look at the source. So I'm gonna show a very short video here. Let me make sure that my computer sound is on. And I will also put on the captions what you're not. The Stop City Funded Internet campaign is a good example of what I mean. So in early 2018, the city of West Plains, Missouri was working on a taxpayer funded municipal internet service project. If successful, it would provide residents with cheaper high speed internet. And while the city was working on this plan, a website for the Stop City Funded Internet campaign popped up. It claimed to be a grassroots community of local fiscal conservatives against the plan. The campaign site looked pretty sleek and professionally designed. It had a clear stated mission and high quality photography. Oh, and also a list of all the ways that municipal internet service projects have failed. And just by looking at the website, you would not be able to tell who was really behind that campaign because it didn't name names or list its leadership. But in the end, someone did discover the brains behind the operation. It was, of course, Fidelity Communications, a local commercial internet provider that didn't want to lose customers. And the only reason they came clean was because a Missouri man noticed the file name of the site's logo had fidelity in it. But most of the time, we don't need to search source code to know more about who's sharing the information that we're consuming. We just need to learn to read differently. So we tend to read websites like we read books or articles. We start at the top of the page, look at the title, and scroll down from there. We read vertically. And many websites look legitimate when you're reading vertically because you're only seeing what their creators want you to see. And creators know what we think makes websites look authoritative. A well-designed logo, references and citations, professional photography, no grammatical errors or typos. And so when you read vertically, it is often impossible to distinguish reliable information from unreliable. But introducing other strategies into your reading, like looking elsewhere for additional information, can help you find out a lot more. When you're on a new website, instead of staying put and taking their word for it, you should just leave. Open a new tab and start looking for more information. That's called lateral reading. It's lateral because instead of moving up and down, you're moving from tab to tab. Basically, what I'm saying is that when your browser looks like this, it, it can actually be good news. Like here's a web. All right, so Bigfoot is still not real. Yes, Alyssa, that I think is my favorite little thing from that video. Um, so I use that video a lot when I am teaching um, workshops about lateral reading because I think that he does a great job of explaining the difference between vertical and lateral reading and also like what the sort of pitfalls of strictly doing vertical reading can be. Um, so I'm just gonna give you an example. This is one of the tasks that they used in uh, that Weinberg and McGrew study is that they had the their internet user groups compare these two organizations, um, the Academy of no, American Academy of Pediatrics, maybe. So they had them compare the website of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, and you can see some information here about that, but they took them sort of straight to, the, to their page, which I will do here. Um, and they had them compare that to the American College of Pediatricians, which is, sounds really similar. Um, it's you should spell college right though because call f does not bring stuff back um pediatricians so similar sounding name uh also when you go to their website you know it actually don't, you know they don't look all that different um but when you dig deeper with lateral reading and this may be an example they all heard about you are able to compare the two and what you can learn about the American College of Pediatricians that you can't learn from their website um, is that they are a socially conservative advocacy group. Um, and that was actually, it's a very small membership um, and really they're focused on, um, they, they're focused on, or they started with a focus on um, sort of objecting to the adoption of children by same sex couples. Um, so they also in the past at least have advocated for conversion therapy. So when we look into 
um, them a little bit more without, you know, kind of falling into just looking at their site itself, uh, we can get a much better perspective. And this is what the fact checkers did in that study. They looked at probably this Wikipedia article and they said, nope, that's not going to be the, rough, the reliable source. And they chose the other one and they did it within seconds, really. Um, whereas most of the students um, and most of the historians either couldn't tell the difference or actually selected the wrong one, the one that was actually more of a it is, it is categorized as a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. All right, so that's an example of lateral reading. Um, I'm gonna give y'all a moment to do this and let me just pull this link. I actually, I learned about lateral reading from um, a professor at Washington State University uh, who's named Mike Caulfield, and I got to see him do a workshop recently, and I have stolen this particular example from his workshop. So what I want you to do is go to this page that I have just placed in the chat um, from Clean Food Facts, Plant-Based Meat Ingredient Guide. It talks about sort of all the bad stuff that's in fake meat. I'm a vegetarian. I eat a lot of fake meat, so this is kind of um, tailor-made for me. What I want you to do is do some lateral reading. So again, you're going off this site to try to figure out who they are, what are they about? Are there any things we need to be concerned about? And you might need to invest, like look around this site a little bit first. You may wanna go down to the bottom. It tells you here that it's sponsored by the Center for Consumer Freedom. So that might be what you wanna look up in some of your other tabs. I'm gonna give you a minute or two to do this. And if you have, um, when you come across things that aren't from this specific website that aren't from the Clean Food Facts site, um, paste links to what you find there. Wikipedia is a really good lateral reading tool. Um, there are some other things that come out there. So yes, Rachel has, has already pasted. Please paste anything you find related to this Clean Food Facts situation that we're looking at. And I'll just give you a moment to do that. This is another activity that I do pretty frequently um, in classes that I teach. Yep, Alyssa's got one from SourceWatch. So, so Wikipedia and SourceWatch are two. I'm glad that both of those are represented. They come up a ton when you are doing lateral reading because they're essentially, you know, kind of big databases of information. And SourceWatch is specifically about sources or publications. Obviously, Wikipedia is a little bit broader than that. Um, but what they give us is information about sites or publications or people that aren't provided by those sites or publications or people. So we give another, let's say 30 seconds, see if anybody else has any anything they wanna share and it's fine to reshare the same stuff that's already been up. There's really only, uh, only so many websites out there. Who interesting, Darren Lee submitted consumerdeception.com. Sounds pretty intense. So while y'all are looking, I'm gonna I'm gonna open up first this one that Rachel submitted. Um, so the Center for Consumer Freedom is now called the Center for Organizational Research and Education, and has had a number of names. Usually, I don't find that to be a good sign. Um, there are a couple of issues that come up when you just read even through the beginning um, of this particular uh, source. Yeah, so uh, Jared just pointed out in the chat, its advisory board is comprised of mainly of representatives from the restaurant, meat, and alcoholic beverage in industries. So what we're finding out like pretty quickly here is that they have uh, an agenda related to fake meat. They wouldn't want you to eat fake meat because they lobby on behalf of the meat industry, um, as well as the restaurant and sort of other sort of food related industries. Um, some of the other things that make us feel a little concerned perhaps, is that um, there are uh, experts on uh, nonprofit law who have questioned the, validate, the validity of their nonprofit status, which is, which is upsetting. And um, Rachel Maddow and Michael Pollan have treated them as an entity that specializes in astroturfing, which is like purposely masking um, the, like who the sponsors or who the creators of an organization are. And yeah, they're real critical of like Centers for Disease Control um, and other, other places that might be, I mean, I think we all probably trust the CDC. We should, we've, we've heard about them a lot more even than usual over the past year. 
Um, but to me, there, there's just enough here that I might think, hmm, well, this seems a little weird. Um, <laughs> yes, y'all are coming. <laughs> y'all are coming up with some. Oh no. Um, it's from the Urban Dictionary. Alyssa, I'm going to tell you, no one has ever submitted an Urban Dictionary response to this before, and I am into it. Also, you can probably all tell here, uh, I like stationary, and that's why all my targeted ads seem to be stationary related. All right, Michelle put one in here. The Hall of Shame. Whoa. <laughs> so, so yeah, we can probably tell pretty quickly like it's not, it's not going to be great. I really want to look at this consumer deception. <gasps> this is really good too, Darren Lee. So y'all are amazing at lateral reading. Um, I could look at these things all day and y'all have pulled out also some theory choice quotes. I will be saving this chat um, that I can uh, look back on after days where no one participates in my activities and say, oh, look at that beautiful day where everyone did. Um, but I am just going to want to just make the make the connection here that we're talking about just looking at website, looking up websites or looking up web content. Um, but it is very much um, this is very much applicable to the skills we're going to talk about. And is going to focus on more in the second half before we get there. Um, I just want to, again, I mentioned that Mike Caulfield um, is uh, one of the people who kind of popularized this idea of reading laterally, and he did so in his OER textbook. I know we got some OER fans in here today. Um, an OER textbook called uh, Web Literacy for Student Fact Checkers and Other People Who Like Facts. Um, it is a great book. I use it all the time. Um, and he talked about, again, the same kind of study content that good fact checkers read laterally. Um, and one of the thing that he, one of the things that he says here that I think is important and that I try to get across when I talk to students about this in the context of web evaluation is that you really have to do both. Um, lateral reading can help you say like, oh no, I do not want to look at the consumer center for consumer freedom or whatever that was, I've already forgotten. Um, but if it, if there's nothing that comes up that's like, you know, shocking or concerning or really upsetting, then you go back with what you know about the organization or the author or the publication, then you can go back and do some actual sort of analysis um, of the source itself. Um, and one of the things that I would recommend um, is supplementing checklist approaches. You know, we've talked about it with the Swanberg study, the faculty wanted checklist approaches. Um, and there is a great website that Anna taught me about called Think, Check, Submit. Um, and when you uh, listen to some of the content in this video, which I really like, or you read some of the things that they provide, um, they give like sort of checklist questions that are really helpful. Um, but they do also ask you to engage in some critical thinking and critical evaluation um, that I think can be supported by lateral reading. So here, man, you wanna find in, find in some good stuff. Like I said, I'm saving this chat. So let me clear out a bunch of these so I can turn things over to the expert on our next half, evaluating journal quality. Um, and Anna, I will run the slides. You just let me know if I have messed anything up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. And thanks everybody for being so active in the chat. So next slide, please. We're doing another quick poll for menti.com. And go there and Jenny has already got it in the chat and let us know about your experience so far with predatory journals. This is another super quick one, just so that y'all know. Yes, very quick. And as the, those results come in, uh, Jenny will share with us how things are looking. Let's take a look. All right, so we've got some people who definitely have and some people who are not sure. And those are completely, it is completely valid to not be sure whether you have encountered predatory journals because some of them are very deceptive. So 
If you have encountered them, you are definitely not alone. A lot of people receive solicitations from predatory and exploitative publications. And if you are publishing and writing journal articles, then you are likely to receive these solicitations. And if you're a liaison or you have colleagues in academic departments who produce journal articles, then they are also likely to encounter predatory journals. Next slide, please. So what makes a journal predatory? Here is Bootsy, the apex predator in my house, attacking a journal. And um, so I might just let it sit here for just a moment. Yeah. Um, so predatory journals aren't trying to like tear you limb from limb or like eat you. Um, they are predatory in a different way. So yes, unlike Bootsy, who <laughs> does like or wants to um, destroy small, small creatures, but he's not allowed outside. So here's a definition of predatory journals that came from a, a multidisciplinary group, not just librarians. I'm not even sure that there actually were librarians involved. It's possible, but these were scholars from different areas who got together to talk about predatory publishing and try to define the problem so that um, others can recognize it more easily. And their definition is that predatory journals and publishers are entities that prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship, and they're characterized by false or misleading information, deviation from best editorial and publication practices, a lack of transparency, and or the use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practices. So there's a lot packed in there. But what are they trying to do? They're trying to make money. <laughs> We're all trying to make money, <laughs> but they are trying to make money without doing anything while also deceiving people. So they are charging publication fees like article processing charges, which are a legitimate part of some open access journals. But usually those fees go toward paying people who work for journals, paying for the services associated with publishing. Um, these journals are charging these fees to authors, but they aren't providing those services. They are not providing legitimate peer review. They may not be providing other services, copy editing, layout, proofreading. So this is basically pay to publish, but pay to publish whatever you want. But not all authors know that that's what's happening. So yes, very scummy. And it's not very ethical, but what is the impact? So obviously it wastes money, including tax dollars and grant dollars, because many article processing charges are paid through grants that, is, that are supporting that research. And as Jenny alluded to earlier, authors who publish with predatory journals can have the legitimacy of their scholarship called into question, and that can impact their careers. And then, perhaps even a bigger issue is that this unreviewed scholarship is then being presented as being real, as having been reviewed. This misleads readers and that can have serious consequences. I think that comment piece that I linked to that provided the definition, there was an example that I think is from that where one of the writers was talking about a person they knew who got really excited about finding a new or developing um, medical treatment that was referenced in an article for a condition that someone in their family had. And they thought maybe this is the answer. And that author went and looked and said, you can't trust this. Like this is from a predatory journal. It hasn't been through peer review. So this, it, it is really sad. Um, and this is something that we don't want to happen to our researchers. And I do want to note that the label predatory makes people uncomfortable in some situations. Some people don't like the term predatory publications and want us to use another word. And journals and publishers, especially those that operate under predatory practices, really dislike being called predatory, especially publicly. <laughs> some of them are somewhat litigious. So is there a better term? There is uh, literature about this. Suggestions have been made. There's a list there on the left that provides some of the words that we could potentially use. But the word predatory is so sort of ingrained in this conversation at this point, not just in libraries, but in other disciplines as well. As well. Um, but at this point, predatory is really the most recognized and used term. So that's what we're gonna to use today. But if you prefer to use another term, that's all right. So how do we know if a journal is predatory? 
Well, there are many indicators. And I was going to ask you to find the predatory journals here, but I'm going to go into more detail about this in a moment. You really cannot determine anything from the title alone. Um, there are some predatory journals on here. There are some real journals that I pulled out of uh, Cambridge's journal list. Um, and then there's at least one that is neither truly predatory nor, nor academic. It's a, basically a marketing publication. But some of these, we've got, we've got them all here and you can't tell from the title. Um, there are some red flags here. And this, so we'll look at a couple of examples. If you see any of these red flags, please uh, enter them into the chat. Uh, I know I'm not a doctor, so that's not the biggest red flag, but yes, they are making an assumption. I mean, I could be someday, but I'm not right now. And the, the biggest red flag here is that they're soliciting me to become an executive guest editor for the Open Transportation Journal. I have written transportation before, but I don't write about it and I don't know enough to be publishing about it. So I don't need to be publishing in this journal and I definitely don't need to be an executive guest editor. Um, there are many red flags here. Perhaps my favorite one at the top, best indexed peer reviewed international journal. Best out of all the journals in all disciplines. Um, yeah, call for paper. Yes, there are some problems. <laughs> So yeah, uh, nobody needs to be publishing here. There is a lot going on and we'll see a similar solicitation from this company in just a moment. Next slide, please. So I won't read these red flags to you. This list on this slide and the next slide is for reference. Um, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide and we'll see some of these examples and talk through um, some of these practices on some of these examples that we will look at in just a moment. Next slide, please. Okay, I wanted to point out a good question that Patrick asked in the chat. In this yes. age of the cries of uh, in this age of cries of fake news, does it ever happen that someone who disagrees with legitimate research attempts to mislabel a journal mm. predatory? That's a great question. So that is a great question, and. I don't know off the top of my head if that exact tactic has been used. If anybody else does, um, please feel free to share. I haven't heard any specific examples, but I would say I would not be surprised at all. Yeah. Um, you know, there have been um, issues in the past in our field with specific, like, like Rachel just said, um, specific publishers being sort of named as predatory, even though they either are not um, or are kind of, you know, walk the line a little bit. So, yeah, yeah. I'm looking at, at some of these chats. Publication, Ellis is asking about publications and predatory journals being repeated in the legitimate press, like news media. That is also happily something I haven't seen a lot of, but it definitely could happen. Um, and yeah, Sam has seen faculty who have been put on boards or know people who work with journals that may be considered predatory. And one of the things to think about with that is that sometimes faculty don't know that their information is being used. So these journals are going out and harvesting names and pictures from sites uh, like university sites and adding those people without them knowing that they're on the, the editorial board. And yes, journal practices can change over time, as Sam says, which is confusing. So on this slide, with I mentioned before, the title alone is not always enough to evaluate a journal. And a graduate student emailed me this week about this journal, the Journal of Pharmacy and Pharmacology, which they received a solicitation from um, just this week, I think. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you. So there are two journals for pharmacy and pharma pharmacology out there. And if the student had just sent me the title alone and not the actual solicitation, 
all I would have seen in Google at the top of the list is the one from Oxford, which is associated with the Royal Pharmaceutical Society. It's been around since 1870. This is an established, respected journal. But that's not what the student was solicited by. They were solicited by the Journal of Pharmacy and Pharmacology from David Publishing Company. And that highlighting on the right of David Publishing, I did not do that. The journal did that. That was in the solicitation. And I guess that's because they're trying not to get sued. Um, you can't copyright a title. So it is possible to have more than one publication under the same title. But if you are purposely deceiving someone into thinking they are publishing with this Oxford journal, you could potentially be sued. So I guess they're hoping that people are not going to notice and they're going to Google Journal of Pharmacy and Pharmacology and think that, oh, this is what uh, they want me to publish with them. So I had to tell the student to avoid that journal. So uh, be careful. You can't always tell based on title alone, sadly. And these direct email solicitations are common and there's really a pattern to them. They often praise your work. They include a citation of something recent that you've published. And this is why they are targeting you. They know that you publish articles. They expect that you are looking for further publication opportunities and they want to make it seem like they are interested in your work. But things kind of break down where your research may not have any relationship to the topic on which they're soliciting content like transportation and librarianship. Sometimes you see poor grammar and spelling. Sometimes they offer you that opportunity to join the editorial board, which you don't wanna take. Next slide, please. So should you assume that any of these direct email solicitations are bad? Well, not necessarily. A lot of them are. Um, and let's go to the next slide, please. You do want to think critically about any direct email solicitation that you read or that you receive, and you want to read laterally too, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Yes, they are hoping that you're only reading vertically when you are sent when they're sending off those emails. And as, as Sam mentioned in the chat, journal practices can change over time, and different people have different experiences and evaluate journals differently. Maybe you're looking for different things. So one journal that was great 10 years ago could have had its practices kind of slide. A journal that started out using poor practices may get better. And you're gonna, you may talk to people who have had different experiences. So all of this is somewhat subjective. And we're gonna look at some examples quickly. So we saw this exact pattern um, on that trans oh, current or open transportation journal which I received pretty recently. But this is the same thing that I have even less experience with. I mean, I breathe, but I can't write about respiratory medicine. So I have no business being an executive guest editor for that journal. So again, I, I think this is actually the same publisher. Uh, and then here we saw the invention best peer reviewed international journal. This one's even worse. Um, but it's the same setup. And the since we're running a little short on time, I won't ask you to find the biggest red flag. I will point it out. In the lower right, you see decision on manuscript, 24 hours, and publication time, two days. So that leaves basically no time for any kind of peer review, feedback, editing, copy editing, layout, proofreading. They're just going to take what you send them maybe not even look at it, put it online. That's not what you want for your scholarship. So we wanna stay away from inventing, but it's not always that easy, sadly. So this is one I got a couple of years ago that it's much more personalized. It doesn't have that form HTML sort of setup, and it's actually within my field. So say I'm a graduate student and I don't have experience with this kind of thing, I could think that this is real. Um, Dear, they've got my name right. I represent the editorial office, blah, blah, blah. We've come across my recent article published in Serials Review. They think the topic is interesting. I'm so flattered. They want me to be on the editorial board and they hope that I can submit my work to the journal. So this is a common setup, a common sort of template for these emails. This is not a journal I wanna be on, but this is, um, this is the sort of thing that can confuse 
new researchers because they just, I mean, you don't grow up knowing about predatory journals. This is something that you have to learn, sadly. Next slide, please. And again, here's another solicitation that at first glance looks like it could be real. International Journal of Information and Communication Sciences. All right, I mean, that's within my field. And open access policy, ISSN, peer reviewed policy. Uh, let's go to the next slide. When I look at their website, this has many things that I would look for on a journal website. Without clicking through, um, I'm seeing aims and scope, indexing, submission information, article processing charge information, a tab about ethics, lots of things that I would look for. So at first glance, this looks like a real site. I mean, or like it could be a real site. And I mean, it is real. It's not a journal that I want to publish with them. Next slide, please. So as we get further into it, we start to see more red flags. No legitimate journal offers you a two for one deal with publication charges. Um, it's just not normal. Also, as Tiffany pointed out, no legitimate journal calls your research precious. Even if you think that your research is very precious, <laughs> journals, uh, legitimate journals don't, that's not terminology that they use. There were some misspellings on that first uh, main page. And when I looked at the editorial board, I received the email in 2019 and their editor in chief was marked as having uh, ended his term in 2017. So like, who's the editor in chief now? Um, so a lot of red flags, don't wanna publish with them. Next slide, please. But not all of these journals, emails, websites show these immediate flags. And we may need to consult other resources to learn about them and to learn whether we wanna publish. That's where lateral reading comes in. So look at the email, look at the journal site, and if you still can't tell, then it's time to ask the internet. And we use some of those tactics that Jenny talked about earlier in the presentation. Next slide, please. So the search engine of your choice is a great place to start. Don't just read what the journal or publisher says about itself. Look at what others say about it. One of the things that I often do when I can't immediately tell what's going on is I type in the name of the journal or the publisher or the conference. Sadly, there are predatory conferences too, and the word predatory. And if people are writing online about predatory practices associated with that journal, you probably are gonna find it that way. Wikipedia can also be a great help here. I know we don't use Wikipedia for everything, but they do sometimes have information about journal or publisher history and behavior and links to documentation. Some uh, publishers have whole like sections called scandals on their Wikipedia pages, and those can be interesting to read. Talking to colleagues, Jenny also mentioned that this is a tactic that some researchers use. So talking to advisors, mentors, librarians who may have experience with a particular journal or publisher, that can be useful. And reaching out if you know someone on the editorial board of the journal, you might wanna ask them about their experience. A super duper red flag is if you reach out to someone and they're like, I've never heard of this journal. Why am I listed on the editorial board? That's a very bad sign. The directory of open access journals can be a useful tool. It's not something that I would say should be the only thing that you look at, but if a publication is included in DOAJ, it has gone through a somewhat rigorous review for inclusion. Some bad actors do slip through the cracks, um, but this is one piece that you can consider in addition to other things. And on the next slide, you'll see an example of the sort of information that you might learn from DOHA. This is the profile page for the Journal of Learning Spaces, which is based here at the library. And it tells us a little bit about that journal, no publication fees, what kind of license does it use, who is the publisher? So that's all good information. Indexing is another thing to consider. Where does the journal say they are indexed? And is it referencing things like just plain old Google? Anybody can be indexed in Google. That's not really something that is a legitimate scholarly index. And it's not something to be shouting from the rooftops either in terms of indexing, nor is like ResearchGate or academia.edu. So look for legitimate indexes on that list. And then you might actually go to that index and check. If the journal says it's in PubMed, 
you may want to go to PubMed and look to see if you can find content from that journal. Next slide, please. There are some websites that track predatory journals. Not all of them are remain active or up to date. And this is something that I don't always or pretty frequently do not give to researchers. Thanks, Steve, see you later. Um, so because you don't want somebody coming in, going to one of these sites that's maybe out of date and saying, my journal's not here, it's fine. Or my journal is here, it's terrible forever. So you really have to think critically about these sites when using them. Think about who is created, creating and maintaining it. What criteria are they using? Are they clear about that criteria? And is it updated? So a couple of examples are linked here. One of them we don't have access to, uh, cables or cables. Um, it's a subscription resource. And they actually have a blacklist of journals they've identified as bad and a white list of journals that they've identified as good. But we can't see either one of them because we don't subscribe, which is probably fine. We can learn this stuff on our own. Uh, next slide, please. But even with all these resources, evaluating journals can be tricky. Next slide, please. And there may not be a clear answer in all situations. You may find conflicting information online or hear conflicting information from people with who you ask. Some people may have had a positive experience. Some people may say that's the worst journal ever. And this is really about determining you as the author, what your comfort level is. And so when people email me with a certain journal and ask me to evaluate it, I can tell them the information that I find, but I can't make the decision for them. It's really up to them, um, especially in cases where there's not a clear answer. I, in some situations I can say, I mean, invent each journal do not pursue this. Um, but in cases where it's more of a gray area, the author has to decide for themselves. And we are wrapping up here. So this can be challenging, learning to evaluate journals. And if y'all have tools or techniques that you use with, uh, with this work, we would love to hear about it. And also, since we're wrapping up, if you've got questions, I know we're running right up to the three o'clock hour, um, I have, I can, I don't know if Jenny can keep the room open, but I can stay if there are questions. And um, yeah, if y'all have questions, feel free to unmute or type in the chat because we've got like a couple of resource slides, but that's, we've made it through the content at this point. So thank you for listening. Next time I'll try to uh, include more Bootsy. Have you found any predatory journals published by legitimate publishers? So I don't know if I would use the word, well, uh, there are some publishers that are not, maybe they have some journals that are, I would say, yes, they're good. I'm thinking of like the whole, what is it? Frontiers Media where an MDPI too, yes, yeah, where they've got some journals that people are like, yeah, this is a great journal, and then some that it's like, oh, I don't know. Um, so I, I kind of consider those to be like gray area publishers. I have a, this is sort of a tangential question. Yeah, oh, go for okay. it. Okay, I wasn't sure you could hear me, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we, um, we love tangential questions here. Uh, so, um, Sometimes it seems like book publishers uh, do the same deal. Um, and that's something I like specifically with textbooks. And I like wonder how aware of this issue faculty are, or if they just like don't care. <laughs> <laughs> or they just they just don't know. <laughs> yeah, so I don't really have experience evaluating textbooks. Um, but I, I know that textbook publishing is definitely a racket. And people are making lots of money off of that, especially with like new editions and things that may not have changed. Um, but I, I think some of that would be would be coming down to like, people are having to make decisions about what to adopt for their courses. 
and hopefully are looking at that content and being like, wow, this is not representative of any kind of review or best practices and then not adopting. Um, but I don't know. It's really hard for me to say without actually having like reviewed the textbooks, but I don't know. I just get like a creepy vibe <laughs> from like when I'm, you know, trying to like figure, I, I don't know. It's probably just me. It's just clearly like sometimes I, I visit these publisher websites and it's clear that they're not interested in the scholarship. They're interested in financial aspects only. And so I worry that, you know, our faculty are publishing textbooks just because like the, the publisher knows that they will be able to sell them to the faculty students. And so I, yeah. I worry about that sort of thing. Yeah, I have no yeah. Idea. In, in that situation, I guess it's kind of more potentially like vanity publishing. Um, although hopefully there is some review that's happening to legitimize what's going on in there. I guess there are many problems with academic publishing, um, even without predatory journals. There are um, many issues. <laughs> Other questions or thoughts? And thanks y'all um, for being here a few minutes after the hour. We, and for participating actually, so much. Yeah, yeah. Audience. This this could have lasted longer. I did cut some of my slides earlier, so I'm glad I did. Um, but we could do like a whole um a whole much longer thing on this. It's really it's my fault. I just get so excited. Um and I just keep going. You all know. Everybody's been talking about there and I, I like uh, Jenny I'm glad that you said this earlier that you like seeing those examples of predatory journals because I think some of those I mean are interesting and also sometimes funny but also sad all right um, well thank you all so much for coming that we have been recording the session so it will go up on the ULVLC libguide and I will uh, close things out now and say a special thanks to Anna for agreeing to present this with me again. Yeah, this presentation was Jenny's idea. So I'm really glad that she made that connection between lateral reading and information literacy and predatory journals so that we could talk about this. Thanks, Jenny. And here we are. Here we are. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye.